Listen for God's word coming to us in scripture. A reading from 1 John. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given us about his son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. God be in our listening. So we are landing our series today. Our Easter season is drawing to a close, and John is landing his letter in the reading that we just heard. Uh, so as we've journeyed our way with one John as our accompaniment, uh, guiding us through this conversation that we've had about why do we not have love? Why is it so difficult to love? And we've talked about it as the other side of the fear of death in all of its forms. What John sort of offers to us is, is his sort of framing of summing up the kind of conversation that he's actually been having with us. And I wonder if we just need a little reminder so that we don't do what, what's been quite classic for us to do as Western readers of the text when we hear the passage that's just been read. And the way that John presents the passage to us that's just been read because he starts to talk about life and eternal life, there's a tendency amongst modern readers to forget everything that he's just said. <laughs> everything that he said over the previous few weeks about love and about a love shaped around Jesus. And then we land at, at this conversation about eternal life and immediately decide, oh, I know what that means. Forget everything that John's been talking to us about and basically think, oh, what this conversation about today is, is about eternal life and what we hear when we hear the words eternal life is this is a conversation about what happens when we die. But if you've been listening to John throughout the previous weeks as he's led us through the letter, and if you read the whole letter, you realize that that's a really narrow way to understand what it is that John's been talking to us about. So I wanna sort of remind us of a few pieces, and one of the best sort of summary passages of what's going on in John is actually what he says way back here two chapters ago <laughs> in 1 John chapter three. He says, do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. I'll just hold for a minute, it's my mom, she, uh... <laughs> it's not Mother's Day in the UK, but she's still mad. <laughs> we know that we've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Right, now think, think about what he's doing there for a second. Notice how he's, he's framing his, his letter for us but he's not drawing it in a pattern of, of life versus death. He's drawing it in a pattern of love versus death. You get life and love are starting to be used interchangeably. What we see John doing, and this is a sort of reminder of the journey we've been on, is reminding us that the call of Jesus is an invitation to a life that isn't framed by a fear of death. And a fear of death, of course, doesn't just mean, remember, dying. Uh, it, it's, it's death in all of its forms, failure, shame, weakness, illness, age, or perceptions of all of those things that we see in the world. 
But the invitation of the gospel is an invitation to an open life, a life that's about loving and being loved, not pretending, and this is the key thing we've been saying week after week, is it not pretending that we need the esteem of being fine. So hold these pieces together. We're called to love. We're called to be loved. We're called to to not worry so much about death in all of its forms of failure, of shame, of weakness, of illness, of age, or perceptions of those things. Ultimately, we framed this a few weeks ago of not pretending that we're fine. Notice what John says at the beginning here. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Now, again, this, we immediately start to imagine people throwing rocks at our heads because we're Christians and we, we think about the martyrs of the church who have had all these horrible things happen to them because they are Christians. But at some level, what John's actually pointing us to, out to us here is that the way that you will live as someone loved by Jesus, as someone open to loving others and open to being loved, will set you at odds with the rest of society. You will appear out of whack with everybody else. You'll appear out of sync with the way that the world goes. It will look as though the world hates you. The whole world is is, is governed by the fear of death, of a selfish way of living, of a way of living that says me first and others maybe. When you come along and start to live in the way of Jesus, you'll start to cause problems for yourself. It will appear as though you're being hated. To live into neediness, to live into vulnerability, opens us up to the life that Jesus models, that Jesus witnesses to, that Jesus testifies to. And John says this is a move from death to life, from slavery to the fear of death to loving one another. So essentially, resist this temptation to hear the language of eternal life and think it only refers to what happens when you die. The language of eternal life, if it truly is eternal, it's not just about the future, it's about everything. And so what John is calling us into is to realize that loving one another is eternal life. One of the ways to understand the life that Jesus gives us is that it comes in loving one another, not being afraid of shame, failure, and all of those various things. So let's come back to the text then from this morning. I've changed a couple of words in here just to offer slightly different translations to help just stir our brain up a little bit. And two words particularly, in the first time we read the text, we heard the word testimony and belief. Perfectly good translations of those words. But the word testimony also is the word witness. And the word belief is also the word trust. And so what we see John's talking to us about in this morning's text as he's kind of trying to land his letter is that to live a life of love is to live into eternal life as witnessed by Jesus. One of the reasons I love this this idea of, of, of translating these words as witness over testimony, although it's kind of the same thing, is that it's pointing us to something. What was Jesus doing in his life? He was saving the world. Yes, he was dying on the cross and being raised so that we wouldn't ultimately live in death forever. Absolutely. Eternal life is offered us to this future forever. 100% that's what the Bible is calling us to. But also it's witnessing to something else. The way that Jesus lived is witnessing to how we live now. A life that's not shaped by possession and the need to be better than everybody else. A life that's not shaped by selfishness and violence, but shaped by loving one another. Essentially, eternal life for John is everything he's been talking about in this letter. Everything we've talked about throughout all this series. Which is why we're left so anemic and so narrow if we take this notion of eternal life, put it on this shelf for something we'll worry about in the future. The gift of God is far too good to just be something for the future. But there's this reshaping of our minds and our hearts that calls us to see that loving one another, whenever we resist that temptation to be selfish, we resist that temptation to shape our whole lives around ourselves, but instead choose to step into loving one another, we're stepping into eternal life. And essentially John's question, I I think John's question is fascinating this morning. Notice how he starts. We accept human witness, but God's witness is greater because it's the witness of God. It's a kind of very, it sounds complex, it's pretty logic. John's like this, when a human witnesses to something, we accept that. And if God comes along and offers us witness to something, we accept that even more. Most people are gonna accept that logic, that that God's 
statement on something outranks a human statement on something, despite the fact most of the time we're quite happy to live with a human statement on something. But then he says, wait a minute, there's a strange thing going on here. Because despite we know that to be true, what often actually happens is we trust God about things of the future. We trust God that he would die on the cross for us. We trust God that he would be raised. But when it comes to living our lives, we don't trust God at all. <laughs> when it comes to living our lives, we say, okay, God, I'll trust you for my future, but not for my present. And at some level, he says, look, when we don't trust God, we make him out to be a liar because we don't trust the witness that he sent us, Jesus. What John's essentially saying, and I'm being repetitive now, but we must grasp this. What John's essentially saying is, what is true of Jesus is true of Jesus. Jesus gives you life in the future. He also gives you life now. Jesus shows us what life in the future will look like. He also shows us what life now will look like. And it would be a strange position as followers of Jesus to hold. This is ultimately, I think, John's question to us. Why would we trust Jesus for the future but not the present. And notice then, he, he brings it in, in, and this language gets very, very tense for us sometimes. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Again, we naturally draw this into questions about heaven and hell in the future. It's sort of wired into us as Westerners to think that's what this conversation is about. But the whole of John so far has been about love and death. It's been about moving from love from death into love. So again, if we trust God, if we have the Son, he moves us into loving one another, which is life, a life that leads into the future. But if we choose not to love one another, if we choose, as John would say, to see someone in need and ignore it, we're not living in life, we're not loving, we're choosing a path which ultimately leads to death. And we don't need to be great philosophers to follow this logic that if we set our lives up in a very selfish way, it doesn't bring the fruitfulness that we think it will. John's inviting us, as he has been doing throughout the whole letter, to have an identity, a way of life, a being that's not governed by my own self-esteem, but governed by an identity outside of me, governed by Jesus. Howard Thurman, in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited. This is an older book these days, not in the kind of theological old, old in terms of us. Uh, it's said that Martin Luther King carried a copy of this book with him everywhere he went. Whenever he was traveling, he took a copy of this with him. Thurman says this to us. Seeing oneself as a child of God establishes the ground of personal dignity so that a profound sense of personal worth can absorb the fear reaction live constantly in this fear of death, this fear of failure, this fear of weakness, this fear of shame. Thurman offers us what John is saying to us is that if we can see ourselves as children of God, if we can see ourselves as loved by God, if we can see ourselves as enveloped by Jesus, this isn't a way to death, this is a way to life. But perhaps the question remains, how do I trust this way of being? That's what John's inviting us to this morning, trust this way of Jesus? How do I trust the love of Jesus and not keep reverting back into the slavery to the fear of death that we've talked about throughout the series? Is it possible to love and be loved in our contemporary context without being shaped by fears of neediness, esteem, failure, and possession? Is it possible to love and be held in slavery to fear? John's word to us is, no, <laughs> because if, you keep, if we keep setting our life around selfishness, if we keep setting our lives around something other than love, it's a path that won't work out well for us in this life, not simply in the next. What John is essentially showing us is that love is life. And that, I think, is the genius of the, of the Bible reading this morning that we, that we heard read to us, is that for the follower of Jesus, love and life are the same thing. When we love one another, when we choose to be loved, when we choose to sacrifice our own concerns about weakness, shame, and, and, and death, and all those things, we step into love, we step into life. But then that strikes us, perhaps, as this thought that comes to mind, if love is life, and we're not very good at loving, 
Is the Bible saying we're not very good at living? Yes, basically, <laughs> it is. <laughs> Stanley Haravas says this, and I, I love this, to learn to follow Jesus is the training necessary to become a human being. Now, most of us assume and work from a premise that you just are a human being, right? That you're just, you're just a human, like you don't need training for a human being. You're born, somebody slaps you, you take a breath, and now you're a human being and you've kind of like, you know, I'm pretty good at it, you know? 45 years of still being human, you know? But what if the gospel, what if the reason we struggle so much with some of the texts today is actually we're not good at being human beings? Actually, our lives without love are less than human. Harvest continues, to be a human is not a natural condition but requires training. The kind of training required, moreover, has everything to do with death. To follow Jesus is to go with him to Jerusalem, where he will be crucified. To follow Jesus, therefore, is to undergoing a training that refuses to let death, even death at the hands of our enemies, determine the shape of our living. I think if we grasp this, we can kind of grasp what Jesus is doing in so many of his parables and his teachings. We assume we know how to be alive. Jesus thinks we don't. We assume we've got life sorted out. It's just a case of which life we're gonna choose. Jesus seems to be saying in the gospel, John is telling us for sure in our letters, if we don't live into love shaped like Jesus, it's not actually being alive. At some level, Jesus' critique of the world is we're just not good at being humans. And I wonder if that even helps us as we watch the news how often do you find yourself, perhaps now this is the language you need, when you, when you watch the news, when you read news websites, when you walk past a newspaper, if those things still exist, you, you see humans. The things we put in our headlines are often humans not being good at being human. What if Jesus was the quintessential human? What if Jesus came to show us what it was like to be human? What if eternal life is being human properly? And I wonder if this might help us think about what Jesus is doing in so many of his parables. We talk here, Harvest talks about death, and we mentioned this last week. You can go and listen to that on the podcast if you want. There's a tendency when we think about death and following Jesus, we start to think about the heroes of the faith that gave up their lives to follow Jesus and physically died. But notice, take Luke 10, for example. In Luke 10, Jesus describes what it is to be human. He's like, if you go to a party and somebody invites you to sit down, take the lowest place. Don't go for the highest place. Like simple, mundane, not overly impressive. Jesus doesn't tell his disciples these, like, you know, go and find somebody to fight, go and find something to stand up against and get mowed down by it. He says simple things like if you have two coats. Make sure the person that doesn't have a coat has a coat. If you're invited to a party, go, but be humble when you're there. Essentially, Jesus is constantly saying to his disciples, experience a little diminishment for the sake of others. Stop putting yourself first, he says. And this is hard for us. This is kind of what we've been talking about throughout the series. It's hard for us because we love thinking about life in terms of possession. We love having our identity shaped by what we own, what we control, what we possess, what we rule over, what we dominate. That's what makes us feel safe. That's what makes us feel like good humans. And yet Jesus comes along and he starts saying things like, like don't go for the esteemed position. Like sit at the bottom seat, sit at the worst table. You know, take the obstructed view at the theater. You know, don't pay extra for the fancy seats, give them to somebody else. And we go, that doesn't sound like living at all. That doesn't sound like the best way to do things because we're so shaped to think about gathering stuff, about getting things together. And then also what happens is when we start to think about what it means to be sacrificial, we often limit ourselves to just thinking about finance. We're just thinking about possessions. But what does it mean to sacrifice the self? What does it actually mean to take the last place? Like, I don't know if you're invited to a lot of parties that have strict seating structures. 
It's not something I get invited to very often. So it's easy to hear Jesus' language at Luke 10 say, that sort of form of being human doesn't apply to me. But what would it look like to live in a context where I did sacrifice my ego more regularly? Maybe I'm not invited to parties with seating plans, but what if I refuse to self-promote myself in the workplace? What if I chose to identify the good work of others rather than the good work of me? What if I forgo praise in my day-to-day life to ensure that other people are seen, recognized, and acknowledged? Like that's, I think, us living into what Jesus calls us to, a life of love that doesn't just think about myself in terms of gaining possessions, but a life of love that also doesn't just think of myself in terms of my own ego and esteem? What if I didn't need to be first at work? What if I didn't need to be first in my street? What if I didn't need to be first off the exit ramp on the highway? These are minor little things that call us into thinking about others differently. Because what what really we're doing and what really John's been talking to us about again and again throughout this this text that we've slowly worked our way through this Easter series, is that our identity is rooted in Jesus and in God's love shaped by Jesus for us. That what we see in Jesus is love. That's what eternal life is. But what I hope you've seen, heard, and pondered on throughout the series is that this is an identity that's framed and formed outside of ourselves. It's a gift, not a possession. It's not something you own It's something you've been given. So life, eternal life, the life of love that we're called to in Scripture is basically rooted in holding everything with an awareness that it's a gift. And the proper reaction to all gift is gratitude. What does it look like for us to live grateful lives? Because a selfish life, a life that says, I earned this, I own this, it's mine and I'm going to defend it, isn't always a thankful life, isn't always a grateful life. It's hard to be grateful for things that you think you deserved. You say, I earned this and I worked hard for this and I deserve to get this praise. It's not really the kind of heart of, you, you've had that situation, right? You've given somebody a gift some, sometime. You've brought somebody a gift. Maybe it was their birthday, maybe it was Mother's Day. And you give them a gift. Imagine, actually, let's think about it like that. Imagine if you took a gift to a mother on Mother's Day and they said, it's about time. (laughs) Like you would kind of feel like that wasn't quite what I was hoping for as a response there. But gratitude shapes us. When someone's grateful for something, you know they don't think they deserve it. When someone's grateful for something, you know they don't think they've earned it. They're starting to see life as a gift, not as something they deserve deserve. So this is why psychologists will tell us that gratitude is actually directly connected to our happiness. If you want to be happy, if you want to be joyful, it often requires us to be grateful because we start, because gratefulness says we're seeing that we're, we're recipients of a gift. The other thing that gratitude is fascinating about is gratitude counters our anxieties and our concerns about self-esteem because gratitude doesn't Well, if we're grateful, we don't see everything as our possessions to own and defend, but rather something that has been given to us. Grateful. How are you grateful? How am I grateful? How much does gratitude shape my day-to-day life? And I think when we start to ask that question, we'll also begin to see why worship is such a significant thing for us as Christians for us as people, because worship is gratitude. At some level, what we do when we gather together as the people of God is it's thankfulness properly ordered. Gratitude is expressed as worship and also within worship. Think about it like this. On one level, gratitude combats that basic anxiety that we have about our fear of losing resource. If it's mine to defend, it's mine to own, it's mine to hold on to. Gratitude lets me see it as a gift. Worship takes me one step further into gratitude by stopping worrying about whether everybody sees me as successful, whether everybody sees me as the main thing. Because what worship invites me to do is point towards a different main thing. When somebody's worshiping, 
They're not saying it's all about them. This is why there seems in the Bible to be a direct correlation between a life of love and a life of worship. Because the life of worship points at something else. Like note this guidance from St. Paul in Ephesians 5. Be filled with the Spirit, he says. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks, there's that gratefulness again, to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our self-centered way of being doesn't want to do this. Our self-centered way of being, our fear of failure, of weakness, of shame, doesn't want to point thanks towards someone else, doesn't want to suggest that something about me is as the result of somebody else. I want to appear like the self-made person. And we're invited here in Ephesians to point it all towards Jesus. And I think if you wrestle with Ephesians chapter 5 today, and perhaps as you go into this week, the sort of shape of a church service will make sense to you. And if we don't grasp this sense of how Jesus forms us by love that comes from outside of us, the shape of a church service will rarely make sense to us. And I sometimes wonder if that's why we struggle with church so much, is we miss that what the church service is doing is leading us on a journey of pointing our hearts at Jesus. And I think when we come into a church service, if our mindset is, this is for me, which is often what happens, listen to how we talk about church sometimes. And we talk about it in very self-centered ways. And if we come to a church service and it's all about me, my engagement with the service is very, very different. My engagement with you is very, very different. What we tend to do is we come to church and say, sorry, give me a second here. <laughs> Let me just say it plainly like this. What we tend to do when we come to worship services and think it's just about me, if we've, if we've not really held what John has called us to throughout this series, then we opt in or out of singing, as Paul's instructing us to do here. We opt in and out of singing on the basis of whether I feel like singing. We opt in and out of praying on the basis of whether or not I feel like praying. We opt in and out of scripture on the basis of whether I feel like it. And we ask, why do we do Eucharist all the time? Because I'm not really sure what that's about. But if we hold what Paul's pointing to here, that when we gather as the people of Jesus, filled with the spirit of Jesus, we point our hearts to the Lord, we give thanks to the Lord, we realize that from the moment the service starts and we're called into worship, we start pretty much every service with a psalm now exactly as it calls us to in scripture, to begin lifting our praise. And then our band come and they serve us by leading us in more songs that point our hearts towards Jesus. And then we read scripture which points us again towards Jesus and finally we meet at the table which is again, it's called Eucharist. Eucharist is the Greek word that literally means thanks. <laughs> it's all gratefulness. We participate in psalms, prayers, songs, scripture, all as gratitude. We come to the table and we say thanks. The great prayers that we pray at the table are known as the great thanksgiving. Because what a really, really proper church service does, what Paul's calling us to here is to journey in thankfulness. All pointed towards Jesus who loves us and shapes what our lives are like. Singing. I love singing. We don't always like singing as modern people. We don't quite get it because we're always used to singing being about us. Our radios are full of songs about us. Our iPods are full of songs about us. And we come to church and the singing points us slightly differently. But one of the things that singing does, and you know this to be true, it's about letting go. One of the things I love about church is it's one of the few places in society where you can come and sing and nobody cares how good you are. Because it's not about how good you are, it's about pointing your heart towards Jesus, pointing your heart towards the resurrected Christ of Easter. It's a posture, an action that we set ourselves towards God. And there's something happens when we bring our worship towards Jesus, there's something happens in us. 
we find ourselves shaped and thankful towards Jesus, which means we don't need to pretend to be fine anymore. We don't need to pretend to be self-reliant anymore. A church full of people that say they're fine and are fully self-reliant is just a delusional group of people. A church of people who have come together in the spirit of, of what Paul says to us in Ephesians, lifted our voices, focused our hearts, heard psalms and scripture, and said, thank you to God, is a group of people who understand God's love, who understand that we are shaped differently. Worship, true worship, the prayers and songs of a people thanking God, are a people who have then moved from death to life as John has talked to us about. When we gather together in a room like this, or in your house and you read scripture and worship with some friends, or just you in your car joining with all creation, blowing out your lungs to shine FM, whatever it is that you do to sort of reshape your heart and remember, it's not about me, it's about the God that is love. You are moving from death to life. We sang it earlier, I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned. Those are really unwise words if you're trying to make it in this world. Don't ever be abandoned. Be defensive. Watch out for the people that are going to steal your, your joy. Watch out for the people that are going to steal your, your, your pride. Watch out for the people that are going to steal what you've earned. And then we come to church and we're like, drop all those defenses. Point our hearts at Jesus. It feels strange. Worship feels strange. Because it is strange because we're not very good at being human. But as we open our hearts up to the love of Jesus, if we realize that the call to love one another is not just a call to love, but to be loved, we'll find that worship starts to become easier. Vulnerability that we bring in worship starts to become easier. The confession that we'll lead in just a moment starts to become easier. Humility and gratitude start to become easier because these are the practices of life. These are the practices of the people of God. Throughout this series, we've been tracking with some of the work of Richard Beck in his book, The Slavery of Death. And before we lead into confession, I want to leave the final words of the series to him. In summary of what we've been trying to say, Beck says this. In all this, our slavery to the fear of death becomes very simple to understand. Love involves risk. And risk entails fear. Thus, love will always begin with an act of courage. And the courage needed here is of a particular sort. It is the courage to experience loss and diminishment, to look like a fool or a failure, to express real need and give up being fine before others. And when we are confronted with all this need, failure, and brokenness, love will be the courage to listen to, accept, and care for each other. Love will be the courage to face down my fears that in caring for you, I will be used up, wasted, poured out, and expended. Love will be the courage to trust that others will care for me as I care for you. Love will be trusting in the needy economy of love over the fear-driven temptation to be self-contained and self-sufficient, to retreat into being fine all by myself. And in stepping into this communal life, we experience our liberation from slavery to fear of death. In the kingdom of God, we experience love, life, and resurrection. In loving others and being loved in return, we move, in the words of St. John, from death to life. So I invite you, pause in your heart at the moment. Hold yourself in a space of gratefulness. Perhaps you've come into the service today with a question of, when I eventually get there, I hope this does something for me. And the invitation this morning as we come to confession in the table is to turn our hearts, point them towards God, and say, thank you. Let us confess. When we cry out to the Lord in our trouble, God will bring us out of darkness. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Let us offer him sacrifices of thanksgiving. Amen. As I said a few moments ago, this, this prayer is known throughout the church as the great thanksgiving. It's like the church service is just a constant sequence of opportunities to say thankful, to stay thankful, to say thank you, to have gratitude in our hearts. And so bring yourself with all of your thankfulness. Listen as, as, as I pray these prayers and we respond to how much thankfulness is shaped in what brings us to this table of thanks. So the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Thanks and praise to you, Jesus Christ, Lord of all, given the name above every other name. Jesus, Lord of all, we worship and adore you. King of righteousness, King of peace, enthroned at the right hand of majesty on high, Jesus, Lord of all, we worship and adore. Great high priest, living forever to intercede for us. Jesus, Lord of all, we worship and adore. Pioneer of our salvation, you bring us to glory through your death and resurrection. Jesus, Lord of all, we worship and adore. Together, every knee bows to you, every tongue confesses, you are Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night when he was handed over to suffering and to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, Father God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. So until Christ returns, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask that you would make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until he comes again. And all of this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. And as we invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts, into our room, we also hear the invitation of Jesus to join him at his table. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him. May we see Christ afresh in the breaking of the bread. I invite you to stand. David will lead us in worship. We'll come and receive at the front and in the middle.
Our practice here at Westside is to serve the youth first and to come with open hands placed out open before us, receive the bread that's been dipped in the cup, say thanks be to God, and take it immediately and return to our seats and continue to worship.